Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet more Warhammer lore. We'll do a somewhat more limited subject today to weigh up for the deluge of last week. So, today we're going to be talking about uh, the dwarves' favoured magical star metal, Grumril, and how it fits into their society. You might think that that seems an odd thing to talk about, how metal fits into a society, but, well, think about it. We value quite a lot of metals, don't we? Gold, silver, etc. And in the case of Grumril, it is valued considerably higher than any of those. Dwarves are, of course, very, very fond of gold, as you can probably imagine, but Grumril is even more valuable, partially due to the extreme scarcity of the metal, and partially due to the artificial scarcity of the metal in recent years. Or, at the very least, as far as the dwarves are concerned in recent years. It's been something like 3,000 years for everybody else, but the dwarves do tend to keep a grudge. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. First, we need to talk about how Grumril got into the old world to begin with, because it is not a naturally occurring mineral. Or, at the very least, not naturally occurring in the Warhammer world. Because you see, Grumril, like all good things, came falling out of the sky and created a very, very large hole where it landed. And I really do mean a very, very large hole. A rough estimate suggests that the impact crater, these days known commonly as the Black Water, or Varandras to the dwarfs, is close to 290 kilometers in diameter, which means that it would be almost twice the size of the asteroid impact on our own Earth that we think wiped out the dinosaurs. And for reference, that impact crater is estimated to be something along the lines of 20 kilometers deep. So yes, a very, very big hole. Luckily for the dwarves, they weren't really around when it landed, though there are suggestions that maybe, just maybe, some of the ancestor gods might have seen it happening. In which case, they had better be actual gods, or have been at one hell of a distance, because that's quite the impact. And it was so long ago that... I'm not entirely sure it was an accidental impact either, since this would be all the way back when the Old Ones, the creators of the Lizardmen, first shaped the world. And considering the Lizardmen themselves are still around and alive, which an impact like this might have made problematic, it would seem fairly reasonable to assume that this impact happened long before any of the current races began inhabiting the Old World, perhaps even as a deliberate part of the Old One's plans to terraform the planet. But that, of course, is all nothing but good old-fashioned speculation. What we do know is that when the dwarves eventually discovered the massive crater that had been filled up with meltwater from the mountains, they dubbed it, as previously mentioned, Varn Draz, which means black water. At the time the dwarves found it, it was already inhabited by a wide variety of unfortunate creatures, some of which could be rather considerable in size. This made any expedition into the waters themselves, um, challenging, to put it mildly, and so the dwarves instead decided to do what they do best and dig their little holes around the water instead of trying to dive into it. And why would they do that, you ask? Because, of course, of Grumril. The meteor contained vast quantities of rare and valuable metals, Grumril being one of them, and it is the only known natural source of Grumril in the Old World. This obvious rarity, combined with its very, very useful properties, meant that the dwarves quickly found it to be a very valuable metal indeed. For you see, Grumril is virtually unbreakable, in fact, Literally unbreakable. The only thing that can even damage Grumril would be more Grumril. And considering the somewhat hostile nature of the Old World even back then, and the dwarves' ever ongoing quest to make sure that as much of said world as possible was a safe space for the bearded folk, you can imagine the value of a nigh unbreakable metal. Of course, the fact that it is essentially unbreakable also has some complications, namely, how the fuck do you actually work it into anything useful? Well, 
Luckily, the ancestor gods had the solution. Utilizing their mastery of the rune craft, they created forges that could be heated to unimaginable temperatures. And now that the star metal could be made pliable by heat, it could be worked. They invented rune anvils and hammers, along with protective wards to allow the dwarves to work the metal without turning into dwarf roast. But of course, heating and working the metal was merely just the first steps. Gromril must be treated with consummate care and expertise, lest the precious metal grow brittle, or separate, or any number of mishaps occur leading to the loss of the metal's valuable properties. For the metal of the gods is incredibly fickle. When worked with the proper rites, the proper runes, and with the correct material, said material often being retardedly rare and valuable in and of itself, Grumril can hold more magical runes than any other metal. It can be made nigh unbreakable, and yet sharp enough to cut stone like butter, and even carve through Grumril plates. But the process involved in making such artifacts are lengthy and numerous. It took Alaric the Mad over a hundred years to create the twelve rune fangs gifted to the Empire. And while certainly working with swords would have probably been a new and unfamiliar process for the rune priest explaining some of the time taken, gives a decent idea of how long it would take to forge a true star metal blade. And even then, the rune fangs were created long, long after the dwarves fall from grace, and are not but pale shadows of the weapons forged by the ancestor gods themselves. Luckily, Grumriel doesn't necessarily need all of that just to be worked into an effective form, although it's never the easiest metal to work, to put it very mildly. It can, however, be fashioned into relatively simple, very relatively, suits of armor. They're still going to be far more effective than, well, quite literally anything else, seeing as it is virtually unbreakable, but it doesn't require the sheer ridiculousness of working runes into it. In that case, a simple suit of Gromril armor might only take a decade or so, rather than half a century, whilst an even simpler object like, for example, a hammer or an axe might only take a couple of years. And bear in mind, it isn't really a skill question whether or not they can be completed quickly. Of course, there is an element of familiarity and skill in producing the items, but it is the sheer amount of stuff that is required to produce these weapons and the various rituals required, many of which just simply take a very long time, often having to be carried out without interruption or pause for the runesmith in question. The blade and the runesmith might also need frequent periods of rest and contemplation, quite literally meditating upon the weapon in question, since no two Grumril weapons or suits of armor are really the same. There's always a level of individuality to all of these items due to how long it takes to make them, due to the various steps that might be required, due to the needs of the wearer, etc, etc, etc. These days, a simple suit of Grumril armor might only have a single rune of protection, meaning that it is a fairly, by Dwarven standards, simplistic piece of armor. Of course, it would still be vastly superior to practically anything else just due to the innate properties of Grumril, but again, it would pale in comparison to the suits used during the height of Dwarven power, which were so ridiculous they could literally bounce ballista shots right off them, and the wearer wouldn't even notice the fact that something the size of a tree trunk just hammered into him. Of course, the knowledge on how to actually make armor like that has long since been lost, but nevertheless, Grumril remains an incredibly valuable mineral, partially because, again, virtually unbreakable, useful enough in and of itself, but also because it is almost a spiritual metal to the dwarves. They consider it to be so incredibly valuable, not just because it's such an amazing metal, but also because it has such a close connection to their history. And items made from Grovril could be considered the prized, almost holy possessions of a clan. Entire wars between various dwarven clans have in fact been fought over the possession of a single suit of Gromril armor, where the various clans might argue over who actually owns it. 
And considering that dwarves keep record backs thousands upon thousands of years, and all of the various laws, the grudges, etc, etc, it can get quite intricate. And part of this, of course, is fueled by the current scarcity. As I mentioned, there is a bit of an artificial scarcity of Grumril armor. During the heights of Dwarven power, Grumril was rare, but not super mega ultra duper rare. In fact, certain ridiculously wealthy dwarf holds might invest in seemingly pointless items made out of Grumril, like utensils or chandelabras or stuff like that, and they did this literally purely so that they could bring the thing out during festivities and go, look at how much fucking money I wasted. I am stupid rich. These days, however, the supply of Gromril has more or less dried up. Back in the glory days, the Blackwater was protected by several dwarf strongholds. Zufbar, Skraklas Ungur, Kulas Ungur, and the greatest of them all, Karak Varn, which at one point was so mighty and so ridiculously wealthy due to their access to Grumril ore that it even rivaled the dwarf capital of Karaza Karak. During the Great Catastrophe, however, Karakvarn was hit particularly heavily, after which Skaven and Goblins streamed into the stronghold and overran it. And that wasn't all. The massive catastrophe that shook the World's Edge Mountains also revealed a massive seam of Warpstone. The corrupting power of this magical green rock has left the Karak so utterly tainted that even the dwarves have abandoned it and given up on ever resettling. However, Gromril is still far, far too valuable to simply be abandoned, and large expeditions are frequently sent out from the surrounding minor dwarf holds, Zufbar in particular, which used to be the primary forge and smelting centre for Grumril, to delve into the depths of Karakvarn and the surrounding mines in search for more Grumril. Primarily, they are looking for the sources that remain above the shattered depths of Karakvarn, because alongside revealing a massive seam of warpstone, the cataclysm also shook Karakvan to its very core, and its weakened underwater fundaments were no longer able to stand up to the pressure of the black waters above, which came pouring in, drowning most of Karakvan and almost all of the Grumril mines. Sadly, however, the above water mines and remaining seams have almost all been fully exhausted, to the point that the discovery of a relatively small seam outside of Karakvan was a gargantuan breakthrough in 657 of the Imperial Calendar, and brought astronomical amounts of wealth to Zufbar before the mine was discovered and subsequently destroyed by the Skaven, who have absolutely no interest in Gromril whatso goddamn ever because, well, they haven't the faintest clue how to work it, and nor do they care to learn. For the dwarves, however, reclaiming as much Gromril as possible is of paramount importance, and they are willing to do quite a lot of undwarfy things to try and get at it. Expeditions into the depths of Karakvan is of course one, but as mentioned, pickings down there are starting to become very very scarce indeed, necessitating a wide array of innovative new approaches, which is rather remarkable in and of itself, as the Dwarven Guild of Engineers will actually allow innovation if it is specifically meant to go looking for Gromril in the Blackwater, including a wide array of submersibles or death traps, let's be honest, and also diving equipment, which the previous dwarves didn't bother with because, well, they could just mine the Gromril in Karakvan. But the dwarves are starting to get desperate. And in all due honesty, if ten dwarves end up feeding the various horrors that live in the water, but the eleventh brings up a handful of Gromril, then that's a pretty good rate. Because before, during the height of dwarven power, Gromril was incredibly valuable. These days, it is far, far beyond valuable. In fact, Grumril armor and weaponry are never sold 
technically speaking. They are only requested. A lord, or indeed the High King himself, may request a suit, or may request a hammer. A hammer made of Gromril is the customary gift as a show of faith and as a bond between a lord and his hammerer bodyguards. The actual fulfilment of such a request can take a while, shall we say, but that is really the only way in which you can get Gromril anymore. It needs to be custom made and custom ordered, and for an absolutely absurd price, of course. And Grumril, be it armor or weaponry, may never, ever be sold or ordered by anyone who is not a dwarf. It simply just does not happen. Though, they may be gifted a weapon or a suit of armor if they have done some truly vital and great service to the dwarf nations. We're talking something along the lines of Sigmar's participation at the Battle of the Blackfire Pass, for which he was rewarded with the Twelve Rune Fangs. But this, again, is beyond rare. Besides the Rune Fangs, the Empire has in its possession one full suit of Grumril armor made specifically for a human, the armor of Meteoric Iron. The Emperor Karl Franz's own armor is made from Black Grumril with the armor of Magnus the Pious worked into it, and Britonia possesses a Grumril Great Helm. All in all, probably less than 20 pieces of Grumril armor or weaponry have been produced for the human nations, and considering they've been around for a couple thousands of years, well, that should give you a general idea of just how precious the dwarves consider said armor and weapons to be. And then finally, to finish up, Grumril has one final use. As mentioned previously, Grumril can hold more runes than any other metal, and can hold runes that simply no other metal can. It is, however, also not only used to hold runes, it is used to create them. Small quantities of Grumril are key ingredients in some of the most powerful runes ever known to dwarf kind. The most famous of which being the Master Rune of Grumril, which takes the already essentially unbreakable armor to entirely brand new heights, making it not only impervious to blunt force or cutting weapons, but also gives it the ability to simply just flat out cancel out physical force. To the point that if a giant armed with a literal tree trunk was to smack a dwarf with said tree trunk, and the dwarf was wearing this armor, he wouldn't even notice. The force behind the blow would simply just be cancelled out. The tree trunk would likely simply shatter, and that would be it, leaving one very confused giant and one rather triumphant looking dwarf. As you can undoubtedly imagine, this is a remarkably overpowered little rune, but, well, even just basic level Grumril is already redonkulously rare, and 100% pure Grumril that can then be ground into dust and used for such a rune, that is an order of magnitude rarer. And now you know what Grumril armor is, why it's so goddamn special, and why it's so very, very valuable to the point where even gold seems to lose a bit of its luster when compared to it, even in the eyes of a dwarf. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.